coincidentally, another friend and colleague that has known me from the time when I had all black hair. <laughs> Actually, we both had all black hair. <laughs> but we came up together through the ranks. Another psychiatrist who gets it, uh, another psychiatrist who understands that while we are a part of the system, we are not all of the system, and a psychiatrist who has a very unique uh, background and skill set in that her work in the criminal justice system from the standpoint of the um, psychiatric services and psychological services and supports arena now extends into large systems where individuals with mental, unmet mental health needs unfortunately reside. Uh, Dr. Cassandra Newkirk is the chief psychiatric officer for WellPath, uh, the entity that in this area manages the health and um, mental health, behavioral health services for our children at the juvenile detention center, for the adults at 201 Poplar, and for the individuals who are housed at uh, Jail East uh, in that correctional facility there. So we've asked her to come and talk specifically since we're focused on young people, we've asked her to come and talk about mental health services uh, in the juvenile justice system in the community. So Dr. Newkirk. as well as the United States is what you have not heard, is that she traveled all over the world representing the American Psychiatric Association uh, on behalf of all of us who are psychiatrists. So I'm going to start out by telling you a little bit about myself. Yes, I am currently the Chief Psychiatric Officer for WellPath, which is a, com which is a healthcare company that is dedicated to hope and healing. You heard a little bit about what we do in the criminal justice system, but we also manage state psychiatric hospitals, we uh, manage and run and operate jail-based competency restoration program. Those are those programs where people living with mental illness who are so sick that they cannot proceed with their charges in court because of the mental illness, we restore them to competency so that their charges can be adjudicated and they can be discharged or if they um, must go on and deal with their charges, so be it. And there are a few other specialized behavioral health services that we provide um, and we manage. But what I really want to talk about, let me just say something. Melanie, thank you so very much. Melanie took us to church, so unfortunately I guess I'm going to be the Sunday school teacher, you know, which usually comes first, but we're just going to do it the reverse. I just met Melanie yesterday and I must say that um, did not know much about her history, but we just bonded because we were with Dr. Stewart, I can say that. Uh, let me just very quickly say, I, the only thing I have, financial disclosure that I have is that I am a full-time employee of WellPath. We kind of only do presentations, you have to do that. Ignore that slide for a minute. I wanted to tell you how I got involved in the, um, if you would, the field of trauma. I have been practicing as long as Dr. Stewart, I found out that she told me how old she was, and we were actually the same age. Um, and so when we were trained, we did not, we were not trained in the role that trauma played in the lives of our patients. But I started working in the criminal justice system as a staff psychiatrist in jails and prisons in Atlanta, because that's where I trained and that's where I stayed for several years. And um, I had the opportunity uh, to, I work with men primarily, but I had a private practice. My private practice was in downtown Atlanta, so it was people like you, everybody sitting in this room, and everybody else. But I also trained at the city hospital. And I also
also, at the same time I was in private practice, I was also seeing uh, street addicts, working in a methadone clinic. I was also working in a community mental health clinic. So I saw folks from one end of the spectrum and everybody in between. And so I actually saw some folks in methadone clinics. And I saw them in the jail, same people, and then they unfortunately would end up in the prison system serving time. But over time, um, I realized, I learned a lot about substance abuse and your basic serious mental illnesses. Went to work in a women's prison. Eh, figured, okay, I've worked with lots of folks, different folks, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the people in my private practice were women, so okay, I got assigned to work in a women's prison. Biggest baptism in my life. <laughs> Working with the women behind the bars was a very different experience. And around about the same time, I also had the honor of being a part of SAMHSA's, um, which is a federal government agency. Uh, they decided that they really needed to learn about trauma in the lives of the patients whom we served. I was, and I don't even remember how I got to be on the National Women's Advisory Council for SAMHSA. And there again, I had my second baptism because I was taught by women who considered themselves survivors of abuse. They sat at the table with psychiatrists, with governmental officials, and told us, well, basically they put us in our place, and told us what we did not know about the issues that they were dealing with because of the trauma in their lives. That was approximately 25 years ago, and now we say trauma-informed care as easily as we say mental illness or challenges, et cetera. But at the time, most of us were not tuned in and not sensitive. So I'm honored to have been around long enough to have seen the sea change. Now, what that meant for me, then I learned to ask the questions about trauma in the lives of my private patients, the people that I was serving in the correctional system, and of the men. And once I started, so we kind of, I kind of got it, because the ladies taught me just how, unfortunately, how prevalent sexual and physical abuse were in the lives of girls and what happened with that. But once I learned to ask the question of the male offenders that I was seeing, I was shocked because it's, those are things that we do not talk about. But when you think about it, we've talked about domestic violence for a long time. Um, and spouses, and usually you're talking about the women who have been abused. We don't talk about the men who have been abused. And we seldom, and this is, I'm dating myself, but we didn't talk about the children. Well, I got to see the result, I got to see the children, because when I saw the children, they were locked up. They were inside the prison walls. And I, I tell folks, it's like, look, Unfortunately, people do go to prison, they do get incarcerated, and we do have to take care of people behind the walls. I don't have the key to the front door, and I don't have the key to the back door. But it is an eye-opening experience, and I'm, hopefully I'm gonna share a little bit about that with you, because unless you've had a family member who's been incarcerated, a child, a sister, a brother, an adult, uh, you really don't understand. It's been over 30 years that I've done this. I've been mental health director at Rikers Island in New York City, Philadelphia prison system, Georgia Department of Corrections, overseeing the psychiatric services for approximately 40,000 offenders. And I was a staff psychiatrist in many different settings in jails and prisons, and five years I was a psychiatrist on death row in Georgia. So I've seen it from one end of the, to the other. I was able to, I, let me just, as an aside, I was able to, treat the guys on death row because there was a moratorium on executions in Georgia when I was in the system. When they started executing people, I left. I could not deal with it because I got to know the offenders sitting on death row as people. And so I had to make a personal decision is who am I? Uh, because they were people like anybody else. I was there to treat their mental illness and that's what I, it's not what they did. It's the people who were sitting in front of me, most of them were victims of circumstance, and I can say that personally I learned that even for those folks, there may have been a very, very small percentage of people that you would consider, hey, it's no help for them, they're just really bad people, but most people aren't. 95% of the people, even on death row, are not, quote, bad people. They were victims of circumstance. And I want you to remember that, because as you're talking about ACEs, and all of the consequences of these adverse childhood events. 
I literally lived that, heard that, but at that time I really didn't know what I was listening to. I just knew what the consequences were. Um, imagine an inmate tried to kill himself, and my job as a psychiatrist was to treat his depression so he wouldn't kill himself so the state could turn around and kill him. To put it bluntly, I was like, that's a heck of a place to be. And like I said, personally, I said, I can't do that. And who am I? And then I've seen, and I got to talk to, treat people who had been exonerated, who had been on death row, and their cases were overturned. So I just leave you with that aside. Um, I've been blessed. I think I have had a uh, most varied experience. It was not what I had started out to do. I was going to be a pediatrician. Uh, decided that all the mothers needed help, um, and that's why I decided to be a psychiatrist. I never thought I'd be in the criminal justice system. Uh, but it has been a most rewarding um, experience um, to basically take all of my experiences, and now I am at a place where I am that hopefully I can really make a difference. And I've already started talking to some of the staff here with PCAT about potentially um, what I can do, what my company can do within the system in which um, that takes care of those folks, especially the children. Uh, but hopefully what I hope is a very short period of time that they're behind the bars here so that there can be a seamless integration if they have to come in and if on the way out that we're all on the same page, same book. But I want to talk about, let me talk about what's going on in the community. You're not going to see many statistics from me because I want to talk in general and leave time for questions. But let me just start out by saying that in the general, and in the general population of adolescents in this country, there are a lot of medical problems and we don't talk about it. And you heard Melanie talk about, we pathologize a lot of issues and we talk from the negative perspective. I didn't listen to the debates last night, but somebody said I heard this morning that we really don't have uh, a healthcare system in this country. We have a medical system. Medical systems take care of illnesses. Being healthy is a preventive system. That is health care, is talking about how to stay healthy, self-care, insurance, Medicare, Medicaid pays for sickness. And we need to think about that. That's the negative part, after you get sick. Well, what about paying for keeping us well? Paying for the gym membership. Uh, where are the subsidies for paying for the higher priced, organically grown foods? I mean, so I need you to think about all that Melanie said. Think about our health care system in these United States of America. It's, it's a medical system. It's not a health care system geared towards healthy living. Therefore, adolescents, Young children are developing diabetes at an early age on insulin. Well, diet, exercise, and a whole bunch of other stuff can help prevent that, but that's not what we are geared towards. And so that's going to have to be something that the village, villages can grow gardens, can grow the chickens, and use the manure to fertilize the gardens like my grandma did. Because that's the way I grew up. I grew up in southern the southern part of North Carolina, so I, I'm a product of the South as well. Uh, did not leave until after finishing medical school. Asthma, environmental <coughs> factors. I don't care what you think. Global warming is having an effect where we live. We, it kind of came to the forefront with Flint, Michigan, and the lead in the water and what it's doing to children's brains. We kind of don't think about it. We've heard about lead paint, but lead in the water, give me a break. But we have to pay attention to that. What is the village going to do about those social issues? Because mind, body, and soul is all tied together. Substance abuse, I don't think I need to say anything else but substance abuse. Let me just say something, the reality for those of us who work with people coming in our front doors in a jail. It used to be, if you walked in our jail, and you were extremely upset and agitated and I couldn't calm you down, 
everybody is thinking, well, they're probably suffering from an untreated mental illness. Now when they walk into jail looking like that, we have no clue. People have died on us because it's some crazy synthetic substance that we cannot test for. They're not suffering from a mental illness. They don't took something crazy on the street. And unfortunately, as so we're actually now teaching the residents, the inmates, when they walk through that door, the detainees, not inmates, the detainees, when they walk in that door, hey, you better tell us what you've been using because, you know, we done had so many people to die because they didn't tell us and we had no clue what happened. It's very, very real. So we need to keep the substances out of our communities because we don't know what people are getting hold of now. Sexually transmitted disease. We don't like to talk about this, but it's very, very real. Interestingly enough, in the younger population, because people are not using condoms, they are having sex, they're not talking about it. And the upper population, which is an aside, which I have, I, I live in South Florida, so the biggest medical, and this is a medical problem, in the retiree population in South Florida is sexually transmitted diseases, because they still think they're older hippies now. And, but I say that because we're talking about illnesses on one end of the spectrum to the other. So diabetes, asthma, substance abuse, sexually transmitted diseases, very young, middle-aged, and older people. Pregnancy. We don't talk about sex, we don't talk about birth control, but these are things that we really need to deal with. We've got to deal with that in our adolescents. And here again, if we're talking about health care, it's about prevention. And obesity. Food, diet exercise, you know the drill. Most of the medical problems in our adolescents and the general population and in our communities are not addressed for a myriad of reasons. A lot of them have to do with um, just who pays for health care, who has the means to get it, not enough qualified health care clinics, and basically then you have caregivers are very busy, um, and what are we doing about health education in schools? When I grew up, we had a home economics class and we learned about health education. I don't know, we're still teaching health education in the school systems now. If not, we need to be mindful of that because if everybody's in on this, then everybody's, you know, that includes the school systems and everybody, as well as communities. And again, um, we don't really address the substance abuse problem because a lot of our children are using the addictive substances and we don't know. A lot of them are getting them from their families, family members, and they don't know that they're taking um, those medications. But I bring this up, they're not being addressed, so a lot of our children are not used to going to physicians, offices or other health care providers. So if you're not used to going to the doctor's office, then you're not familiar with what happens in a doctor's office. I'll bring that back around to what I'm talking about. I just want you to hold that thought for a minute. Uh, because a doctor's office or talking to a nurse can be a very scary thing if it's not something that you've grown up with being taken to the doctor's office and your family explaining to you what happened. I did my internship in pediatrics, and I will always remember the first girl that I saw who was 12 years old and pregnant, and she did not want us to do a vaginal exam. And she was pregnant. She was obviously pregnant because she'd never had one. And I will always, and it, that just struck me as just so, I don't even know if I have a term for that. But it was real, and I had to deal with that. It was very real. No prior health care, but now she's pregnant had no idea how she'd gotten pregnant. <coughs> Those are real issues for us in our communities because there was no one in the village, family, to talk to her, to help educate her about those issues. Most common mental health issues that we see in adolescents in the general population include ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. My disclaimer about that, it is probably overdiagnosed, misdiagnosed by physicians who I am a believer in that, and I'll talk a little bit about the labels later on, uh, because a lot of what we see is post-traumatic stress disorder secondary to all the ACEs that you guys have been talking about. And yet, clinicians who are not sensitive and not trained about these issues, and especially the issue of racial 
microaggression and trauma that some of our children live with every day that we don't talk about in mixed audiences either. And that could be if you live in a community and you're listening to gunfire every night and wonder when a bullet's coming through your house because somebody down the street, some little girl sitting on the sofa, you know, unfortunately, bullet came through the house. Don't you think that, you know, it's all over the news and everybody's talking about it. Well, what do you think is going to happen to that kid to whom it hasn't happened, but they live in that community? Hello? It's called post-traumatic stress disorder. It's just like veterans who've been, you know, fighting to protect our freedoms. They have those same visualizations and traumatic memories, as does that five-year-old, you know. We really, really have to be sensitive to that. But ADHD, so a lot of folks who put on medications probably don't need those medications. And let me tell you a real life story for me. So I told you, I had to learn about trauma in the lives of women. So I'm working in a women's prison. This lady was referred to me, oh doc, she's so sick, she's hearing voices, she's seeing things, she was on a lot of psychiatric medications when I got her. We started talking. And during one of my sessions, she dissociated in front of me. And what I mean is, she literally changed personalities, she spazzed out, and I'm using the term spazzed out because this is about the only way I can, and she became somebody else, and I realized she wasn't with me. Her body was there, but it was like on the Starship Enterprise. We went on holiday, because she was somewhere else, and I'm sitting here. Well, I went to the psychologist, because we were in the midst of being trained on the effect of trauma on people, and I went to the psychologist, and I said, hey, you tell me you know a lot about trauma and dissociative disorder. I know a lot about medications and schizophrenia, and this lady is not suffering from schizophrenia, but I don't know what she has. By the time we got done, we figured out she had dissociated, we asked the right questions, she had been very traumatized. I was able to get her off of medications, get her in the right rooms, get her what she needed to have, all medications were stopped, completely different diagnosis. But I tell you that story. So for kids who are being diagnosed as ADHD, and you're looking at behavior, but if you haven't asked the right questions, you know that old saying, you don't know what you don't know? So even as clinicians, if you don't know what the right questions are, which is why it's so important for us as clinicians to listen, but we're told all kinds of things about why we can't talk about it. Uh, the things that have actually happened to us. Um, just as I am advocating that we listen to each other, we also must listen to our children. A lot of children don't talk to their parents or, the, or their caregivers because we're busy on our phones. We're talking to somebody, we're texting usually, or we're looking at Facebook, and, or if they do bring up issues, especially children to their parents, they are dismissed. Um, I remember my, who was it, my grandmother told me, I started talking about something, oh, you're too young to feel like that. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, depending on who you're talking to, you may get those kinds. So if you hear that, you're not going to ever, as a child, you're not going to say anything else to that person again about what may really be on your mind. Um, discharge planning from the juvenile justice system, just like from a jail or prison with people living with mental illness or some sort, the justice system has to have the connections to the community. If I do good work, my staff, myself, we've worked with, we've reached out, we have a sense of what a child may need. We reach out to the community, but we need to have the community providers understand who's, who the clinicians are in the inside, and since we're talking about children at this point, inside the juvenile facilities, who they are, because a lot of them are you. Uh, the people that we hire are the people from the community, who are the professionals from the community. They're not people from the outside, they're people who's, and a lot of them work part-time, the nurses, the doctors, the psychiatrists, the general medical, the pediatrician, the clinicians are your neighbors, your friends, your family members. They're the same people. They actually, a lot of them also, just like I did, worked in many different systems simultaneously. So we are sensitive, a lot of us, as what's going on in the community, but we have to be sure that they understand like what really is going on in the PCAT program so that whatever the community is doing in that 
that system those children. That doesn't stop. It doesn't have to stop because you're on the inside. And let me just tell you, those are some very sensitive officers. I met the jail commander yesterday, phenomenal woman, who talked about her journey and how much she's learned. And let me just say, the officers over there, they're talking about trauma-informed care. Inside. And then even never. I mean, I was pleasantly, but let's put it like this, they got it. So if they got it, everybody need to get it. And these, but the goal, I want you to understand, the goal is to keep the kids out. But if they gotta come in, let them be in there at one time and never come back. But that means you gotta wrap around, you gotta, they have to, the children have to understand that you have their back. And if they do go in there, that you wanna come visit, that you wanna keep those services going. And yeah, I got your seat warm over here in the group. I know this is what's happening. As Melanie talked about, so if they do have to go in, if they are, you know, just like she was saying, she was at the hospital with her husband, if the kid is locked up, the churches, the community, the centers, the clinicians, you gotta be sure that you have those people that do the outreach when the kids are in there. And take the parents, if the parents are around. Because a lot of times, if your kid's never been locked up and they go in, everybody is scared. It's like, oh, what is it like over there? Da, 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 da. And actually, and let me just end by saying this, it was, it is a sad state of affairs, and I've had this happen to me, when a kid gets released and they don't want to leave. And they cry to the officers, I don't want to go. I've had women, I've had men, who do stuff to get another charge because they didn't want to leave a jail because it was better behind the walls than it was back home. And that is the sad state of affairs in this United States of America. I just want to let you guys know that is real for those of us that work on the inside. And that should not be. But that's real. As the commander said yesterday, first time she ever heard a kid tell her that all she could do was cry. She was so happy for the kid, and the kid started crying. But that's what, and, and just, um, there's some big hearted folks and they need your help because they want to do more. So let me just end there because I know my time is up.